Hey, yo, what it do, y'all? Let's get right into it. It's Sanctum Day, baby. My favorite mechanic. Here I am bringing you my guide on how to do Sanctum. Uh, we attempted to make this succinct, but you have to understand I am a bit of a nerd and I definitely have played a whole lot of Sanctum. I've been playing it since it was introduced in 3.20 and therefore I have a lot of knowledge to share. Uh, it's really difficult to get all of this synced down, especially if I want to make sure you actually understand as much as possible coming out of this video without making it too succinct right so i apologize for the length of this video but i promise to make it worth your while right because you're probably here because you want to get rich you've seen me or somebody else and maybe it's ventrua's zero to hero that he did maybe it's screenshots on reddit maybe you've just like watched group players complain about how effective sanctum is relative to their currency per hour, right? Like you've probably just heard people talk about sanctum this, sanctum that, sanctum this for so long that you're starting to think, man, you know, let me get out some of that money. And that's why you're here. It's my imagination. And so let's do it. Before I start to do all that, we need to talk about what actually get, you get from sanctum. The main export of sanctum is divines. If you ever wonder what keeps the divine market in check, in the game it is sanctum runners we produce more we produce more divines in sanctum than most content combined with the exception of things like affliction league magic find where you were just pumping out raw divines onto the floor all the time that was like a very rare exception to this but since the reintroduction of sanctum in 322 that has been its purpose a ridiculous amount of divines as well as a couple specialty uniques such as Sandstorm Visage, the, the Cornerstone Helmet for Hex Blast Miners, even though there's a better helmet, we won't get into that, or things like Eternal Damnation in the past. Original Sin also comes from here. You get what I'm getting at. And so in this guide, we're going to cover a number of things, how, like literally how the Sanctum works from top to bottom, talking about the floors and the rooms, some tips for the rooms themselves, what you know you get from each room, the boons, afflictions, how to actually run Sanctum, how to set up your relics before going in there. And then towards the end, I'm going to give you some build recommendations in case you mostly are just looking to do Sanctum, but haven't actually picked the build yet. I have some recommendations for you uh, towards the end once you've actually learned everything you need to know. So before we get into it, thank you guys for clicking on this video. You know, if you find this video helpful at all, you want to boost this out there to people like comment, subscribe, interact with the video it helps me out, but it also really helps the video, which is the most important thing, getting the knowledge out to the people. And, you know, I greatly appreciate you guys for helping me in this journey of reaching people without further ado, let's get into it. All right. So as we get into the nitty gritty of how the sanctum works, I need to let you know to be forgiving with yourself. This is my generic disclaimer that this content is hard. You will fail when you are learning. Um, I would love to sit here and tell you that this is easy content, but it's not. It takes time to learn it. It takes time to get comfortable with the movement. It takes time to get comfortable with the fights. It takes time to get the right decision making put together. It is just like a roguelike in all of those regards. So be gracious with yourself as you're figuring this out. Now, the actual layout of a sanctum is very simple. There are four floors in which you encounter eight rooms which includes a boss. All of the rooms on a floor have a name and the name will tell you what type of room it is. It also will indicate the reward you get from it, such as hovering one and seeing major chest reward or because it's major chest rewards, right? Additionally, the end, we kill the boss, you will get access to two currency altars, which allow you to choose money that you get as rewards, which we'll talk a little bit more when we talk about the various reward type rooms as well. Now, Let's talk about the rooms themselves, just kind of preface you for what you'll be seeing. There are four types of rooms that you actually have to deal with, and then a mini boss in a boss room that exist. So type one is just the kill room. There's nothing fancy, no smoke and mirrors here. Walk around the area, kill all the rares and guards, be done with it. It's that simple. Type number two is our find exit rooms. They are four corner layouts much like affliction literally just go find the corner that has the exit in it from where you are exit trap rooms or trap gauntlets depending on how you thought i don't like to use the term gauntlet because one of the room types is literally called gauntlet floor two's exit trap room is named gauntlet um there are it's a trap gauntlet you have to move your way to the exit through a gauntlet 
there are shortcuts in every one of them. Every exit trap room has a shortcut. It is also worth noting that the fourth floor has two exit trap alignments, even though they're under one name. If you click on entombment in fourth floor, sometimes you will get the fireball trap one, and sometimes you will get the rune trap room. So you'll need to be comfortable with both rooms. Rune trap room, far easier, by the way. There are shortcuts in them, like I mentioned, and I will have a gallery of screenshots for the shortcuts in the description down below. Now, the last type of room is battle arenas. These ones I really need to talk a little bit more about because even though it's very simple, you know, throw hands with the enemies in a circle and dodge traps. I just want to give you a little bit of a heads up about the three types of traps that you can face in there. There are flamethrowers, lasers, meteors. That is ranked in the order from easiest to hardest to deal with. The flamethrower is a beam that you can very easily kite around. Gets chanked up on like walls as well, if there's any walls to stop it. Laser pointers, they follow you along the ground. The beam and the ground does damage. Not too bad outside of specifically desecrated crypts on the fourth floor. That arrangement for the laser pointer room is really, really bad. And then there's meteor rooms which just suck in every variation because it's highly reaction based. There's not a lot of planning that goes into media rooms. It is just a hands check. So be prepared for that. Now, I also mentioned that there are mini boss and boss rooms, which I'm not going to cover them in too much detail as I don't believe any of these bosses to be particularly difficult once you have enough damage, like once you have a moderate amount of damage. I do have a couple specific notes though that you should be aware of. One, on the second floor in the Reliquary, you find a boss that is modeled after the Grave Trough boss. If your damage sucks, make sure you have Chaos Res because he does a lot of damage. Just like little like Chaos projectiles have killed me in the past numerous times. On the first floor, in the Scriptorium, you find a boss that is based off of the Crimson Township boss. You do not need to fight him in the middle. You just need to kill his clones while dodging his AOEs, which they amplify as you start to kill clones. So be ready for that. When fighting the twin, the two bosses on floor three, kill the guy with the mace first. Uh, they, they enhance each other when the other dies. And you would rather the mage be enhanced instead of the guy with the mace as the Shockwaves and earthquakes are way more obnoxious than like a little bit of blood puddle action. And for Lycia herself, I have two major tips. There's a couple of things I could recommend you, but there are two major tips that I think you just need to know about. One, at the start of the fight, stand in a position such that she moves that you can LOS her with the wall to your bottom left later on. It's very important. She moves out on her first attack, let her charge to you there and dodge and start beaming her down. And once you hear that iconic voice line. Oh. Once you hear that line, she's going to start charging up a divine ire. Go hide behind that wall. That way you don't actually have to move that much in the dangerous red smoke section that actually does affliction damage. Or not affliction damage, resolve damage. And it'll just beam the wall and you'll be safe. If you cannot get behind a wall when she's charging that, such as during the second platform or during a less fortunate alignment later on during this first phase, uh, or this first part of her first phase, you'll have to get behind her and do some funny jiggling with like blink skills and whatnot to keep yourself from taking damage because this is both real damage and resolve damage and it does a lot of both of them. It's actually why uh, a lot of Sanctum Runners will have Topaz Flats on, even as with a Mage Blood. Now, once you get to her phase two, which is after killing her on the second platform, she has a couple of actual attacks. They are lesser versions of what you've seen if you've done the Citadel map and done her Uber version in T17s. The main thing to be aware of, the tunnel that she, that she like spins around, that is fizzing chaos damage, and it hurts like hell. Watch it. She also has the spears still, and most importantly, the intermission. The intermission in this fight, unlike T-17s, is not based on anything else you kill. It is simply just a time. I believe it is 10 waves. 
You just simply dodge them all out, head to the edge of the arena, use your blinks to reposition as necessary. It's going to take some time to get used to the awkward uh, framing of the angles because in 17s, you might just take them out. You might just absolutely blow up the beyond boss that spawns instead, whatever it may be. This is just my warning to you that it also happens in the Sanctum. And then once you've killed her, you get loot. You get unique relic, relic, potentially more, depending on your quant, as well as then all the loot from the end of the sanctum and end of the fourth floor down below. Now, with that in mind, we need to actually talk about what goes on in all of the rooms and whatnot to get you to this point. All right. Now that we've talked about the rooms themselves, let's talk about what you get from the rooms. I have five reward types. They're in this chart here in case you need to reference them or use them for planning. You know, something just to help you visualize what all you can get from a run. There are five types. Chest, Fountain, Merchant, Currency, or Curse Pack. Starting from Chess. Chess will award you with Aureus Coins. You use those to go shopping from the Merchant. You use those to get the currency from Altars, like after the Curse Pack or just the actual currency rooms or after a boss room. Fountains are used to do a couple other things. There's a couple functions of them. We'll talk about those in a little bit. So those are the main functions of your coins. They also can get taxed by afflictions and boosted by boons, all that great stuff. It's also worth noting there are two types of chest rooms. There are minor and major chests, which, as you can imagine, minor chest rooms just give you less coins than major chest rooms. So something to keep your mind on. Fountains have four subtypes. Each of them does something quite different from the others, and so it's very important to actually know what all four of them do. Base fountains are the most common. They just give you some resolve back, 25% of your resolve back in exchange for five of your coins. You can get a benevolent fountain instead. Sometimes from like an icon will show benevolent fountain, by the way. And it'll cost you 150 coins, but it'll get a boon out of it. Fantastic for if your merchants are too expensive or you just don't have enough coins to interact with the merchant in the first place. Afflicted fountains will give you 50% recovery. And so you might be thinking, well, this just sounds better than base. Not necessarily. It does give you an affliction. So if you can't actually ignore afflictions or if the afflictions that you could pick up might brick the value of your run, these are very high risk in what you do, but they are great for recovering in a panic. And then there's Radiant Fountains, which will give you 200 inspiration, give you a boon, and remove an affliction. These are extremely powerful fountains and also very rare. Definitely beeline towards them when you see them, unless there's something much higher priority on a different path from the Radiant Fountain. Okay, next up, Merchants. You go shopping here. It is just, you go in and you get to see a selection of boons and sometimes relics, and then you can also restore resolve there. The main use of the Merchant, of course, is the boons. Boons are how you make your runs more rewarding and faster, stronger, etc. And relics are just nice things to shop. The reason I have them is kind of like a meh type of thing about what they offer is that they only can ever offer the item level of the run itself, which is item level 83 at its peak versus say the ones that drop from the guards, which will actually drop at item level 85. And item level 85 is much better because of the T1 modifier, such as plus two runes revealed or merchants have two additional choices. But it's still a good way to get relics earlier on or, you know, if you're an SSF, etc. And then Restore Resolve is a panic option if you just really need to get some resolve in, right? Currency rooms are just that. They give you currency rewards. I have it on the sheet noted as what the format is so that when you see the visual for it in-game, it's not super confusing. And this is that it will tell you the three currencies that are offered from that room in the three slots that they come in. Right now, end of this floor end of the whole run. End of this floor means when you kill the boss at the end of the floor. So for example, Varaketh at the end of floor one will reward whatever is in the middle there when you kill him. There will be a chest in the room that follows. Versus end of Sanctum, which is after killing Lycia's second stage, that's when you then go underneath her room and pick up the stuff from this chest. That's the general breakdown of currency. I also just want to give you the heads up that the best currency rewards, especially like divines, if you've seen those fatty divine explosions, come from the currency altars that you can see in the third and fourth floor of a run at a high enough eye level, which if you're running I-83s, is always. The last type of room reward that you're going to get is a curse packs. These are the most interesting to me. They're 
you're going to start out hating them because they give you like stress from the way that they constrain your resolve. But I promise you, they are very worth it as you get more comfortable. They make your run a lot stronger. They make your rewards a lot better. They are Kiss Curse. You get some positive effect and some negative effect. Not necessarily always a boon and an affliction. Sometimes you might see, you know, get a major boon in exchange for 50% of your maximum resolve. Sometimes it is remove a specific affliction in exchange for gaining a random affliction, right? You have to gauge out what you want there, but as long as you are willing to take one of the packs, you will be able to access the currency altar that is also stored behind the cursed pack. And that's a large part of the value. Not only do they make your runs stronger at a risk, but they also will give you another source of currency, which is another way to fish out, say, divines on the third and fourth floor. Worth noting, by the way, you are not required to take only one pact. If more than one pact is beneficial for your run, you can take two or even all three of the ones offered to you. All right, now that we've talked about what you actually get from the rooms, we need to talk about the boons and afflictions that you can get. Some of the ones that highly prioritize as well, right? Boons are buffs to your run. They're equivalent to say like relics or artifacts from other roguelites. They're just literally during this run buffs that you get to make the strength of your run and in some cases the output of your run better there's a couple of categories of them there are major and minor boons i have a couple sets of boons to keep your eye on no matter what so this first category these are considered to be my number one boons i look for these every run when possible and that is all thing i crystal chalice scrying crystal this tier of boons all have one thing in common which is that they give you unlimited access or unlimited access and baby access really all seeing eye it does exactly what it sounds like it is a major boon so fairly rare that reveals the entirety of every floor of the for the remainder of this run very very strong especially because it also overwrites the effect of smokes if you have like red smoke for example you can't see room types you can now see room types if you took golden smoke because you got screwed over by a random affliction, all seeing I will let you still see those rewards. As well as again, it shows the entire map. Insanely strong, crystal chalice, lets you ignore minor afflictions. The ones you already have will still do things to you, but the ones that you would come across in the future do not apply. And since there's no way to lose crystal chalice during a run, you are straight, or not no way, but there's only one or two real ways and you can avoid those. You can pretty much always use Crystal Chalice as a way to make sure you don't get your path being blocked by bad afflictions. Insanely strong. And I put Scrying Crystal in this tier, even though it only is a plus one room shown as opposed to all seeing eyes, everything shown. Because I think you'll see Scrying Crystal a lot more often. And I didn't want this category to just be things that are more or less in the category of like, oh yeah, just drop divines in your maps raw. Haha. <laughs> when Scrying Crystal is honestly also insane it does not ignore smokes unfortunately but just the extra room of knowledge is very very powerful next up there's the character power tier uh ornate dagger sigmund vial harefoot these three make your runs faster ornate dagger increases your damage sigmund vial decreases the enemy health and harefoot literally just gives you movement speed these three make runs so so much smoother uh, you'll hear Sigmund Vile talk about like, you know, the combo dagger plus vial, which lets you absolutely, absolutely shred bosses. And then Hairfoot is just good for, you know, comfort. Then I included one tier that I value for a couple other reasons. Some of it's survivability, some of it other utility, which would be Rusted Chimes, Fright Mask, and Silver Chalice. Rusted Chimes gives you inspiration for gaining an affliction. This is one of my personal favorite safety relics just because it does provide you with a lot of value across the, the full length of a run, especially if you get it pretty early, like floor two, just you'll come across a lot of afflictions during runs, especially if you aren't playing the merchant strat. So this is a good way to get your inspiration up to, you know, give yourself a buffer of safety. Right mask is monsters deal less damage. And you might be thinking, isn't this sanctum? Aren't you supposed to take no damage? Yes, but you're watching a guide, which means that you likely are not at the point where you should actually be playing ZHP Sanctum yet and actually playing perfectly no hit wise. You're not at that point yet. And there are a couple of attacks in the Sanctum that actually do an unbelievable amount of damage. The 
rain, the hailstorm from the frost archers. I don't remember their names. As well as the cleave from the dude with the longsword. Both of those do a lot of damage. Like, it did a lot of raw character damage and can outright kill you, as in, like, the thing that gives you minus 10%. Not your resolve. No, no, no. Straight up kill you uh, if you get hit and you don't have another survivability. ability. Fright Mask reduces that threshold. It also gives you a little bit of leniency against Lycia's damage as well. And Silver Chalice is the third one in this category. Literally, just because I like Silver Chalice, it lets you fish for major boons, such as All Seeing Iron Crystal Chalice, as well as the other major boons. There's quite a few major boons that are worth having. Now let's talk about afflictions as afflictions are well the things that make your runs worse they are restrictions on either your character's power or ways to get you killed or ways to reduce what you can do on the map there's just a lot of things that you need to be aware of and it's a large part of the decision making in picking rooms now it's worth noting there are major afflictions as well as minor afflictions major afflictions do only come from a cursed packs though so you're not just going to randomly find your way into, say, like Corrosive Concoction or Ghastly Scythe. Instead, you will randomly find your way into some of these, which I have two categories. Avoid these, please, and I would prefer not to see them. In the Avoid These, Please category, Deceptive Mirror, Golden Smoke, Purple Smoke, Black Smoke. Deceptive Mirror is all time the worst affliction in this game, um, simply because it will point you to a different room. I feel like I don't need to elaborate too much on why that's a terrible idea. Golden smoke, it hides rewards on rooms. Now, if you're, you know, if you're hunting money, I think hiding the rewards that you get from each room is pretty bad. Purple smoke hides afflictions you're getting, which is also really bad in terms of like protecting your run. It's very easy to say like half purple smoke. You know, you have no idea where you're going. You start picking around. Suddenly you've stumbled into a cursed prism plus poison water and it's a nightmare, right? suddenly the run feels a lot more difficult. Black Smoke simply reduces the amount of rooms you see by one. It's the opposite of Scrying Crystal. And I have this in this list because, well, knowledge is power in a, in a roguelike like this. You actually need to be able to see where you're going and make those decisions effectively. Other afflictions on the list, the, you know, avoid when possible list, Fiendish Wings, Liquid Cowardice, Accursed Prism, Poisoned Water. Fiendish Wings, it just is a safety pick. It makes monsters faster, which is not actually the thing I'm concerned about. It's more specifically a lot of really strong safety builds do utilize chill and or freeze as a way to also control monsters, especially when their damage is a little bit lower or if you just have afflictions that make you do less damage. And so get, taking away the ability to chill them actually can be very detrimental, uh, including like, you know, Lycia, for example, right? Liquid Cowardice. This is one that's in here mostly because it's annoying to deal with. If you get Liquid Cowardice, just take off your flask and you'll be fine. But it does make your run slower. Um, if you have a Mage Blood on, by the way, your Mage Blooded flasks are not affected. Uh, but this one sucks, especially for like a Hexmax player who needs their mana flask in order to play the game. Uh, you just kind of lose 10, 10 resolve every time you need to press this flask. And that's a large part of also why this is on this list for me. A Cursed Prism gives you a random minor affliction every time you get a minor affliction. We do not like random afflictions in this household. Um, like when possible, we avoid random afflictions unless there's no other option because uh, that is really, really bad. Again, you can end up with things like Deceptive Mirror. Same case for Poison Water as it gives you random afflictions when you touch a fountain. We like fountains being useful. Poison Water basically turns every fountain tile into a dead tile unless you have something like Crystal Chalice right? They don't want that. And that's just generally like a short list. There are a lot more boons and a lot more afflictions to keep your eye on, especially as it comes to specific strategies. But I think it's more useful if I just cover these here. Just like a couple really important ones that are generically impactful to everybody. Some of the other things are more specific to runs or the level of your character or your level of comfort in the sanctum. Just want to highlight these. Let's get ready to talk strat. Now that you have the basics down of how the Satan works, let's get into actual play strategy, right? Before we get into the specific run strategy, we should talk about play patterns, which generally can be summed up into two parts. Part one, building your run's strength. And part two, building your run's value. So what I mean by this in particular is that 
floor one and floor two, especially if you're farming for, say, like you're looking for divines, you're looking for exalted ores for some reason instead of just going to Harbinger, or, you know, you're hoping that you'll see that ever elusive mirror of Calandra. You can't see those on floor one and two of any run ever. So we don't really care too much about the currency rewards on one and two. They can still be useful. Say it's early league and you're thinking about this league where glass blowers were at a ridiculous premium. Then yeah, sure. Make sure you get those glass blowers. But generally speaking, we're thinking more about specifically getting our boons up. Right. And so how do we get our boons up? Coins and merchants are the main way. Stacking up enough coins. Think seven, eight, nine hundred. And then finding a merchant. Getting the big boons that really make your run pop off. Remember to refer to think about the list of boons that I gave you earlier as far as like high priority boons to get for every run. As well as later on, I'll show you some ones for specific runs that are a little bit higher value due to the circumstances. But that's going to be like one of your major ways of getting run strength. You can also, of course, get that same type of power from an accursed pack. Remember, like I said, those are a gamble, but they're very worth gambling on because of the power they give you, especially because they don't actually cost coins to get the power from. And sometimes you just don't have enough coins to effectively make use of the merchant. Benevolent fountains also function under the same guideline, only power, but it is entirely random power. You could hit it and get all seeing eye. You could hit it and get like engraved orb or something, right? Like it could be who knows what, but it might be worth it for you early on just to help get the run stronger. And of course, radiant fountains fall into the same bucket. You're just trying to set yourself up to succeed in these first two floors, because now once we've done the, tw done the two bosses and we're on floor three, it's time to start looking for money, right? We're looking for those divine rewards. We're looking for accursed packs to really push the needle forward on our output. That's the goal. Now we're in floor three. Maybe there's a couple booms here, there that are worth diverting for. Maybe the merchant, you know, you're running the merchant strategy and you're thinking, okay, a mirror or fortune would duplicate the divines already found. So now merchants are higher priority, but it's because it's tied to your rewards. You're no longer looking for a cursed packs because you want character power. You're looking for a cursed packs because you don't see divines on any of the rooms that you can see, but you need divines. So you look there for divines, right? That's what you start to look for in those last two floors. And the combination of those two parts of your strategy, again, run strength and run value put together creates the high value state, the run that you want to, that you want to have. And that's the general strategy, no matter which strategy you end up employing or whatever investment level you decide to put into Sanctum, these rules are pretty strongly applicable across them all. One other thing is your decision making. You want to make sure that you're making good decisions as you move through the Sanctum, specifically as it pertains to view distance on the map. Not like literally when you're in the room killing things, but specifically when you're choosing the room. By default, as I mentioned earlier, you can only see two rooms. There are boons that can affect this. There are afflictions that can affect this. So you want to make sure you plan your movement so that you don't pigeonhole yourself into an affliction that you can't see right now. Because what if your run's going fantastic and then suddenly you get forced into deceptive mirror or you get forced into golden smoke? Now your fantastic run is running on a prayer, hoping that you click into rooms that give you currency, which I've had that happen before. And instead, all I clicked into was coins and fountains, apparently. So you don't want to have that happen to you. So you need to make good decisions as it pertains to that. And that's why you'll see in some examples, you might have to click a room that seems a little bit less advantageous directly right now, just to make sure that you don't screw yourself over later. Those are all of the like generic tips that I have for you though. It's time to get into the specifics. And just before we get into the specifics, I do want to let you know that all, th all of those strategies covered in this video will have an accompanying cheat sheet in the description so that you can, you know, add it to your Awakened POE trade, for example, or keep it on a second screen nearby, just so you're aware of what your targets are, what you're aiming for, how to set it up, etc. Let's get into that. So. Let's start talking actually how do you make your money strategy number one is honestly considered to be the out and go of sanctum strategies the quant strat which is named after the primary stat on your relics increased quantity of relics dropped by monsters this is used specifically because 
stacking enough quantity on your relics will guarantee, or very, very close to guarantee, that Lycia will in fact drop you two unique relics and two magic relics every time you kill her, as well as increase the chance of seeing magic relics drop off of various guards, rares, and mini bosses and bosses, right? But the most important part of this strategy is the consistency at which you will see two unique relics from Lycia. This is the Alk and Go strategy. It's very simple to put together. You just get four quant relics. You'll see on the image there's a version that has three, and I'll explain that in a second as well. But you'll put four quant relics together and then one other relic in there, ideally either one that gives you reveals or coins or Blood of Innocence to go start also running for Balance of Terror if your character is strong enough to fight the buffed up Lycia. And so what does this actually export? Currency and unique relics. That's the main thing. I also included on here the stats for magic relics that do matter in case you end up dropping one of these. I want you to be aware of what people are actually paying for on their relics, right? But the main thing is that you're looking for unique relics when you play this strategy. You're looking to get through the whole run, hopefully find some good currency, right? You know, you're taking all of the good currency you can find, you know, 14 chaos, 12 GCPs, 30 glass blowers, two exalts, one divine. You open the box, it's a smattering of currency at the end, but it's a decent amount of currency. It's definitely more than what you paid for the sanctum. And then hopefully when you killed that Lycia, she also dropped you a unique relic that was actually worth something within the two, which I included what unique relics are actually worth in the list. But just to name the specific ones that are very, very important to know, original scripture, of course, is the one that gives original sin. This is definitely one of the most coveted items in the game. There's also our Divinity and Gilded Chalice, which you can sell to other Sanctum runners who are running the more advanced strats, or maybe you keep them for yourself when you're getting ready to run those strategies yourself, as they maintain their value throughout the entire league due to the fact that they are their value is not linked to items, but rather specifically the amount of additional divines that they can create. Therefore, they are always priced in divines. It's fantastic. Or something like Chains of Castigation, the relic for Sandstorm Visage, which does decrease in price over the course of the league as Sandstorm Visages start to, you know, be oversaturated on the market or maybe people are corrupting them, whatever it may be. But that starts to decrease in value or in previous leagues or especially if you're in hardcore, the power and the promise, which is the relic for its simple damnation. Stuff like that is important. So again, quant strat, you just stack quantity on your relics, kill Lyceum get whatever little currency you got throughout the run and hope that a good unique relic drop. It's a very simple strategy. Quick note before we move to the next strategy is about this version that has the three quant relics instead of four. And it's because when you're running this strategy, you only actually need to have about 72 to 74% increased quantity due to the fact that there is a boon enchanted urn that will give you 30% increased effect of your relics, which will put your candlesticks, the three candlesticks, over the threshold needed to give you highly consistent, it's supposed to be guaranteed, but I feel like I've had this not work once before, but basically guaranteed double drops from Mycia, which allows you to have two off slot relics instead of one, or even in the version that uses the reveals, you can just take out what, like say the coffer relic and put in two more reveal relics there instead. But I included the one with the candlesticks because I wanted you to see you could also use processionals for merchant additional choices if you prefer more raw character power in your run as opposed to more consistency in potentially spotting the mind. Like it's a little bit of consistency, it's not a whole lot. It's just little stuff. And the more important thing is both of these steps work you towards the next two strategies I'm going to cover because of course the out can go strategy is not the peak of Sanctum. It's not why everybody wants to run Sanctum. It's not what you're seeing these insanely explosive screenshots from on average anyways, right? Sometimes people get insanely lucky, but on average, that's not what's creating those explosive screenshots. The other strategies are both of these methods start to lean you towards purchases that you need in order to get into the bigger strategies. Let's get into those. All right. The first of our big boy strategies, well, big boy, this is more of the medium lad strategy is our reveal strat. Up on the screen here, you'll see the basics of the information you need, but you know, again, continue listening. So you actually hear the details that are important here. The setup for this is nine two point two slot relics which eight or nine of which will include additional rooms are revealed on the same map obviously you can start this with one additional room but ideally this is the two additional rooms are revealed 
relics. If you stack either eight or nine of these, and if you choose to not stack the ninth, it is because you are running Hour of Divinity. Hour of Divinity is a unique relic that disables your ability to get boons, but in exchange will duplicate two rewards at the end of the run. Very quick explanation of what Hour of Divinity actually means. It cannot duplicate when you take money now. If you took five chaos right now in a room, it's not going to duplicate that. What it does is you get to the end chest after killing Lycia, and then it's like, all right, boom. All those rewards that said end of sanctum, end of floor here, I'm going to duplicate two of those. And so ideally it's two double divines, right? You go times two times two. So that's four divines that you had ready to go. Our divinity comes through, doubles both of those. Oh yeah, eight divines from my sanctum. That's the dream. That's the point of running Hour of Divinity. So it's also why we pair it with the reveal strategy. You are using the reveal strategy to spot out divine rewards or mirror, but divine rewards. And if you don't see them, then you're like, well, ugh. time to go look for a cursed packs. You're using this to open up basically the whole map. These reveals with stack this high, especially with an enchanted urn, reveal the entire map. So you're using this strategy to farm raw currency as opposed to the previous strat, which put a lot more of its weight into the unique relics and saying, Jesus, take the wheel in terms of how much currency you actually get. This strategy aims to focus more on the currency and then the unique relics you can get at the end are more of a side product of the process. Does that make sense? Hope it does, right? It's more of a side product because you're after the money. That's the goal. And again, I really want to emphasize, it's emphasizing the cheat sheet as well. It's like, as you forget this part, it's on you. When you're using our divinity, you do not want to take end of run rewards that are not divines or mirrors, unless you are towards the end of the run and you can't see any divines in the future. So you're like, I just got to get some value out of this our divinity to start to cover my losses because I'm not getting the payout that this is priced around. Our divinity at the time of recording, it's about 1.2 to 1.3 divides per. So it is definitely balanced or priced around the fact that you will get divines. So you want to really actually make sure you're gearing yourself towards getting those divines. Um, I will also note that this strategy is notably harder than the strat before it because you do not get bibs. Simply the act of not getting boons reduces your run power a lot. And so you'll need to actually have a strong character as well as be comfortable with the run or okay with accepting the risk of burning 1.2, 1.3 div per run while you get comfortable playing without boons, but playing with full knowledge of the map, you know, trade-offs and whatnot, right? Now that's everything here. It's time to talk about the big strat. The big strategy, of course, is the money strat. The merchant strat, more specifically, just like every roguelite, playing around the merchants ends up being the best way to play the game in the long term, and Sanctum gives us fantastic tools for investing in them. Let's talk about the relic setup. A lot of processional and tome relics. You can also use the Gilded Chalice, but I'm going to make that a sub note later. The important stat here is the merchant has two additional choices. You can also run this with one additional choice to get started, just to get a feel for it. But plus two is going to, when it's really going to take off. You, the idea here, the core of this strategy is to flood the merchant with choices so that you can see the relic you want the soonest. Not the relic, the boon. The boon you want the soonest. Grab all the boons you want, get the merchant to cost a ton less, pull all the boons out, and then you start to grab specific boons. You're looking to pull major boons because they can be offered in the shop at a rarity, which is much more common with plus choices and buying out mer buying out boons, as well as things like Sacred Mirror and Mirror of Fortune to duplicate rewards later in the run. That's the, the core of the strategy. And so to that end, we go plus two choices. Now, there is a BIS version of these relics that also includes the suffix reduced merchant prices i am going to tell you now you do not start on that option it is something you invest into and evolve as you just grow a love for this strategy right uh because the prices on those relics get insane i think when i checked earlier this week 
just one two choices and good merchant prices was like 150 dip. So it's a very, very high investment strategy if you want to go all in on it. Now, how do we play this strategy? Because I have to cover this one in a little bit more detail because the strategy is a little different than the other strategies we covered. The other strategies I covered so far play very well under the general strategy strictly. This strategy has a modified version, specifically in the sense that we are really hunting merchants. Merchants are almost higher prior than the coins we need to buy from them. Because we're only really looking for a couple specific boons out the gate. The major one being Silver Tongue. Silver Tongue is incredibly high prior because it is 50% reduced merchant prices. You get this boon, you get, again, half cost boons. Now you can start buying up the shop. And that's what makes this strat work without the suffixes. Once you get the suffixes, they add up together. You get to about like 84, 85%. And if you add on Enchanted Urn on top of that, now you have 100% reduced. And that's why the setup is so expensive because then once you have Enchanted Urn plus Silver Tongue, you are literally buying out the full shop every time, no questions asked, right? But until you get there, it's just looking for the good boons that are massively discounted. As well as, of course, All Seeing Eye is always fantastic. Tristel Chops is always fantastic. I named on the sheet as well, Scrying Crystal for more information and Sacred Mirror and Mirror of Fortune are great on floors three and four when you've found a divine reward that you just need to duplicate up. Another part of playing this strat, because like I said, floor one is about your setting up the run's power level. Make sure you are avoiding the afflictions I have on the sheet for sure, but there's a couple others that just didn't really fit on the sheet that, you know, you might find to be a little bit more annoying on your personal life. I didn't find too many of them beyond these six to be absolutely destructive, but these six, especially the first three, Rusted Coin, Golden Smoke, Purple Smoke, can really end your run at a rapid pace. Rusted Coin sets the merchant to only ever show one thing. We just spent all of our relics on showing 12. You can see how bad that is, right? <laughs> Golden smoke and purple smoke hide rewards and afflictions respectively. What is the point of the merchant investment if I can't see the rewards that I'm then trying to dupe? And what is the point of playing a strategy like that is this volatile if I can't see the afflictions that I need to dodge? That's why these three are like the really heavily avoided category. But otherwise the strategy is the same. Play for run power. It's just that your run power involves the merchant a lot more so than other strategies. And then floor three, look for a source of divines duplicate those divines now we can take that a step further which is well the gilded chalice because technically without gilded chalice you don't have to play around mirror fortune and sacred mirrors interactions with this type of strategy because you know you don't have that high of an investment riding on each individual run you just have you know the run to do and complete and therefore it's a little bit less stressful but when you're betting 2.5 to 2.7 div per run on the fact that you're going to pull divines out, you've got to make sure you're min maxing around only taking divines at the end of the run or, you know, end of floor if you really have to, but you're just taking divines so that Gilded Chalice can dupe them because Gilded Chalice functions a lot like Hour of Divinity, but instead of only duping two rewards, it dupes four rewards. And now you might be thinking a lot like Hour of Divinity, but Hour of Divinity disabled boots. Yeah, that's not the downside for Gilded Chalice. Gilded Chalice's downside is that you cannot recover a resolve, which playing this strategy correctly anyways, you actually lean really, really heavily into inspiration. I have had a number of runs where I've hit the inspiration cap of a thousand playing under this strategy. So you don't actually need your resolve at all. And that's fine if you can't recover it. It can just be consumed by a curse packs anyways, while we fish for more divines. That's the beauty of this strategy. It is my favorite strategy by far due to the just raw power of the run. It just feels good having Harefoot, the Sanguine Blade or Sanguine Vile plus the Ornate Dagger combo. It's a fantastic combo to have in every run. You know, tons of major boons, you know, 30 boons, six major boons. Like it just feels good having that level of power. So I think you'll enjoy it. And the point of this strategy, of course, is currency. Nothing else really comes from this strategy besides currency. The uniques that you drop, of course, can matter, right? Like, I'm not going to tell you that the Hour of Divinity that you drop is pointless or that the Gilded Chalice you drop is pointless. But you are definitely more so in this for the currency, especially when playing with Gilded Chalice. And that's the fun of this strategy.
I do have one more bonus strat that I'm not going to cover in too much detail here as it's not a super trade relevant strategy outside of maybe the first 36 hours, but it's a very good SSF strategy or a private leak strategy if you're trying to get started in an environment where you cannot trade for the relics you want. And this is a coin conversion strat using the first crest. The first crest is a terrible unique relic that has no use to trade outside of this particular use and it's much better for SSF in which you can convert the coins you have at the end of your run. So once you've killed Lycia into either relics experience or tainted currency and the experience one kind of sucks the tainted currency one outclassed by beyond but this relic one is insane it is definitely the best source of magic relics out there and so i put together this strategy some time ago when learning how to do sanctum and other content besides trade and i feel like it's worth being aware of it was much va more valuable in the original iteration of sanctum when you couldn't really trade these things super freely and what it gives you is you're stacking coins. Coins when you complete a room and coins at the start because you have nothing else to choose there for coins on that slot. You can also do chests have a chance to double. I find the difference between the two of them to be pretty mediocre, right? And then you're just running through, getting as many coins as you can, you know, maybe taking merchants to look for a gold magnet or like try to get access to gold coin, protecting yourself from things such as floor tax, especially floor tax and it's like literally and run ending. And you're just looking to have eight 10 12 19k coins at the end of the run so that when you kill i see it you drop more relics than you can hold it's a very simple strategy i will have this infographic in the description as well i just wanted to put this out there as like a thing if you're trying to figure out how you get your relics because you're not in trade this is how you do that okay so now that you know everything you can get from the sanctum let's talk about the most important thing what am i actually playing in sanctum right Obviously, the footage you've seen in this video is from my Hex Blast Miner, which I have, you know, guides all over the channel for. But there's a couple other builds that I do recommend as well, and it's based on a set of criteria. The criteria really comes down to a couple of things. Damage, speed, lack of interaction. Those are the three things that really make a good Sanctum build. You need to have high single target damage. That's very repeatable, right? We're not talking like meme seven second setup discharge character single target i need consistently available fast single target damage that's why hex blast mines really fits that category but also things like penance brand fit that category or bama etc the next thing is the speed of the character because at some point your damage stops being the wall on this character i'm currently at like 50 million dps and the only way i could wall out on damage is if i started to do like winds of fate runs for some reason which i have no plan to do so speed, literally just your ability to get around in the sanctum, whether it be through movement skills or through raw running speed, very important. And third is the lack of interaction. You get so much stronger in the sanctum if you can simply not interact with what the enemies deal do, whether that be because you don't have to aim or simply because you don't need to be in LOS sometimes if you need to play safer, etc. And so under these three criterion, Here's a couple of the builds that I very heavily recommend, things that I have actually played in a lot of cases of these builds. Hex Blast Mines on any of the viable ascendancies, Trickster, Occultist, Assassin, even like in quiz if you're doing like Contradiction, for example, all of them very good. Penance Brand on all of the viable ascendancies, in quiz, Occultist, Elementalist, Assassin, Trickster, <laughs> you get the idea. Penance Brand, very strong. Bama very strong this is actually sanctum when it came out in 320s that's when people put bama on people's radar finally for how strong it was sing in single target you could also do get similar results with something like an srs character but you're going to want to convert to bama if you plan on running sanctum as like a more serious thing shockwave totem even after the nurse received after total league still an insane character for sanctum farming there's also there's a number of other characters you know high investment spark tornado shot has been used to do it in the past you're again it's just high damage setups that do not need to interact with enemies i even played icicle mines in recent memory right just not interacting with the game and doing high damage makes sanctum very farmable for you and with that said i believe that's everything or at least as close to everything as i can get into this video right um, I just, you know, want to take time at the end of the video, especially if you actually watched all of this. Thank you so much for watching this. And also thank you for taking an interest in the best league mechanic in the game. I think I speak on behalf of Lycia and Lycia Associates, but I say welcome to the fold. <laughs> I hope you enjoy your stay. May you have tons of divines. Again, if you find this video helpful in any way, shape, or form, please, you know, interact with the video, share it out there, like it, all that stuff. Again, 
not for my sake. Look, I appreciate the views. I appreciate the attention, but that's not the purpose of this channel. It really is just getting information out there to people who need it. Um, that, you know, my life is in service. It's always been what I, what I love to do. Been doing it for a long ass time. Figured I could bring it to YouTube. And I just wanted to have another opportunity to serve you guys, especially as a thanks for all of the love and support you guys have been giving me this league. Please enjoy responsibly. Uh, or maybe not responsibly say it was a little addictive. So, you know, like I understand, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Anyways, thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions about it, feel free to ask them in the comments or there is a Twitch and a Discord in the description. You can find me on Twitch in the evenings. Sometimes not super consistent yet. Uh, mostly working out my next schedule and how it works with my life or again in the Discord. I'm pretty much always able to see what's going on in the Discord. So I will respond there if you ask me things there as well. Not in my DMs though, <laughs> right? All that good stuff. Again, thank you guys for watching so, so much. Uh, this has been a Herculean effort on my part. Probably be a long time for you to see something of this size for me again. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed the Sanctum. Take care and I'll see you on the next one. Peace.